Hey, welcome back once again, all you CISSP wannabes. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day. I'm Colin Weaver, and every single day I come at you with two questions to help you as you continue your studies. Let's go ahead and jump right in it. Okay, question number one. Which of the following are reasons why you would implement logon banners? Go ahead and give those a give those a look. And then when you think you've got the correct answers, go ahead and click on play after, of course, having clicked pause. And then we can break it all down. All right, you wanted to pick three answers. Your first choice that's listed here is to provide a welcome message or welcoming message to connecting users. And that is absolutely not one of the reasons that you would go and implement logon banners. In fact, statements saying welcome or, or something to that vein are generally regarded as being inappropriate in a logon banner. So uh, they, they, they don't want to go in and say that, oh, hey, everybody's welcome, come on in kind of a message. So. Uh, no, you don't want to really provide a welcoming statement. Number two is for it to serve as an active notice for a, or a notice of active monitoring for your users. This is absolutely something that you would do. If users are connecting to the system or to the network, they're going to be monitored. At least we would like to say they're going to be monitored. And you're going to go in and keep an eye on what they do, and you want to make sure that they understand that. And also that there's potentially consequences for things that they do while connected to this network or to this resource. Okay, next choice says, how about you provide some system information uh, for the connection? Absolutely not. So to go in and provide the device's name or, or IP address related information or something like that, you don't really want to give any additional information regarding this particular connection when somebody establishes their initial connection to it. Uh, because if the person is a bad actor, then there's a potential for them to be able to gain yet more information about your system. So we don't want to offer additional system related information when somebody connects. All right, how about deterring hackers from attempting to connect? Come on, they're hackers. Do they really think that some menacing message that you offer them is going to cause them to go, ooh, I should stay away? No. So, you know, it, no, not at all. It just, it's not going to go in and cause anybody who's already got ill intent to go, oh, well, let me go ahead and rethink this because they have a really intimidating logon banner. It's not going to do it. Next choice is one of the correct choices, which is to make sure that you establish that people have no expectation of privacy. So again, you're connecting to my system, to my resource, you're gonna be utilizing it, and by connecting to it, you consent to monitoring, and that you should not have an expectation of privacy while you're connected to this network or to this system. So that's an important thing to be able to go in and establish and make sure that people understand, so that if they don't uh, like that, or if they do want to have privacy, then they know not to connect to your system. And then the last choice is the third correct choice, which is to define who is allowed to access the system. This is usually very broadly veiled to go in and say that, you know, connection to this system is restricted, it's for authorized users only. If you're not an authorized user, then you should leave immediately. Those kinds of statements. Um, again, it's, it should never be some sort of a blanket opening welcoming statement that you would find on a logon banner. It should be something that is very specific as to who's allowed to connect, you know, and, and, and something as general as saying only authorized users of the system should be able to connect to it or should connect to it. All right, let's move on to question number two. Question number two today is, of the items that you're going to see listed here, which of them provides the greatest capacity for individual accountability? Go ahead and give those a look. Give us some thought. Click pause if you need to. When you're ready, click play and we can talk them through. Okay, first item on the list says hashing files to ensure integrity. Uh, no, hashing files to ensure integrity does nothing to really help you with individual accountability. The only thing that a file hash is going to do when standing by itself, if you just take a hashing algorithm, say SHA1, and you hash a file, that's going to go in and show you what is effectively a mathematical representation of that file in that moment in time. If that file is subsequently modified, then the hash would be different. None of that has anything to do with holding you accountable for anything because anybody can make a change to the file and the hash would simply reflect the change that was made to the file, not who made the hash. If you want to do that, you need to get a little more involved than just straight hashing. So no, this is not the correct answer. Next item on the list says, how about you log activity per IP address? Well, most environments that you encounter these days uh, make use of DHCP to dynamically assign addresses to users. While certainly you could have logging and tracking of who had what IP address on which day and could have some measure of accountability for it, you're not really going to get the best uh, level of individual accountability as it relates to the other answer choices that are here. And this again is one of those little funky things that you might find on the CISSP exam is that it's not necessarily that an answer is right or wrong, it's, sim it's simply going to be that one answer is better than another. So 
while you have a small potential to enforce individual accountability using IP address logging, um, let's see if there's something better. Let's look at the other answer choices. All right, next choice is setting permissions on folders. Well, setting permissions on folders is going to go in and control who can access the contents of those folders, but it's not going to do anything as far as individual accountability is concerned. So, um, yes, it constrains access, but it doesn't enforce accountability. So, um, still not the not what we're actually going into looking for here, because just because you have permissions on a file or on a folder that goes in and says that these ten users have the modified permission, um, that just controls who can modify it. If you wanted to enforce some accountability in that circumstance, some logging on those folders would be useful, but just the permissions themselves aren't going to go in and give you what you need. All right, how about individual sign-on per user? Very much so. Uh, one of the things that we generally frown upon is any notion of shared credentials, where users go in and make use of uh, one account and multiple users go in and benefit from it or use it. Now, I'm not going to say that it is wholly and completely unacceptable to ever have shared credential situations because they do, in some circumstances, occur. But for general purpose, everyday getting your work done kind of stuff, you should absolutely not be sharing credentials. Because if you don't, or if you do share credentials, excuse me, if you do allow people to share credentials, there is no accountability. Hey, six different people have the login password for the router, and now a change has been made to the router that's caused a network outage. Who did it? Well, one of the six people who had the password did it. Which one? I don't know. Okay. But if you have each individual user have their own sign-on, their own individual username and password, then when somebody logs in and performs an action on the system, it can be reconciled to that individual user, and then we have a better chance at holding that user accountable for the things that were done. So absolutely, individualized usernames and passwords or individualized sign-ons, I should really say more appropriately, is one great way to take your stuff a big step towards accountability for the actions that people take on a network or on a system. All right, and the final choice here was to go in and limit the number of people who have physical keys to a building. Uh, if, if 10 people have keys to the building, that doesn't give you individual accountability. That again says that, hey, somebody didn't lock the door last night. Who didn't lock it? Well, anybody could have not locked it or somebody unlocked it. And which of us was it? Well, it was one of the 10 people who have keys. So it's still not going to give you the individual accountability. So if the answer choices that are here, the best one is single sign-on, implementing single sign-on for going in and doing that. Now, again, I want to reiterate that there may be a time and a place where you find some shared credential scenarios in your network. In fact, there's a link that I put down below that goes in and discusses some situations in which that might occur. Um, but for the most part, individualized user accounts is the most appropriate kind of solution to search for when you're trying to get some um, user-based individual accountability in your system. All right, appreciate you being here today. That's two more questions down. Hope they help you as you continue your studies. Uh, I will be back tomorrow to ask you two more questions. So thanks. See you.